Hey everybody, I'm here at beautiful Cuesta College. I'd say it's about 70, 75 degrees outside with a light breeze. You guys there at Colors of Sequoias, I have this sinking feeling it might be 100, 110 over there, something like that, with not too good air. Anyways, with that in mind, I'd like to again uh, introduce my tech assistant. This is none other than Jackson Howe. Now take a look at Jackson here. We still haven't got a haircut. He's resisting me, uh, being a typical teenager. Uh, but he's been working out, as you can tell. He's getting more muscular probably every time that you see him. Is it evident to you guys? Oh, there, 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 there's there's no doubt about this. He's also rocking my old Jordan 1 Carmelo's. Could you please show him? Get those up there. Look at those things. I had those for about eight years. Carmelo's. Those are really good. Okay. Thanks, Jackson. Get the heck out of here. All right. Now, um, this exercise will take a little bit longer to explain. This is on... Um, pressure belts and winds. So let me get started on this. First of all, a low pressure system is also called a cyclone. In a cyclone, the air converges at the surface and rises. We associate cyclones with stormy, cloudy weather. High pressure systems are also called anti-cyclones. The air is subsiding and moving out in different directions. We associate that with clear weather, sunny weather. It could be hot or cold, but it would be, it would be clear, okay. With that in mind, I'm going to do something for you called the model of atmospheric pressure and wind. Model of atmospheric pressure and wind. Models attempt to duplicate reality in some form. If you've had economics, you probably had lots of models introduced to you. Uh, models about spending habits and saving habits. They're trying to duplicate human behavior to try to facilitate understanding. So my model is going to try to facilitate some sort of understanding for you of how the winds and pressure belts work on our planet. So, like many models, there's some assumptions built in. My first assumption is gonna be that we are at um, equinox. That would be like March 22nd or September 22nd when the sun is directly overhead at the equator. At least initially, my second assumption is gonna be that the Earth is not rotating. When the Earth is rotating, the Coriolis effect comes into play. It deflects winds to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So for now, no rotation, we're at equinox. So what I'm thinking, and that's always dangerous when that starts to occur when I start thinking, but if we were at equinox and the sun were directly overhead at the equator, it would, the air would be the warmest at the equator and it would rise. The air would be the coldest at the poles because cold air sinks. And that's why I have the arrow right here. So if the earth were not rotating, you might have a circulation in the atmosphere that looked like this. The air would be rising near the equator and subsiding near the poles. Now, if you can think about this three-dimensionally, the globe would come out like this, and these cells would come out like this also. So, at the equator, the air is converging and it's rising. That is low pressure. The air converges and rises. So near the equator, we have a belt of low pressure. It's called the equatorial low. And it rains a lot near the equator. I've been to the Amazon jungle and it rained every day, about two o'clock in the afternoon, it just poured. Indonesia, 300 thunderstorms a year in many parts of their country. So let's put the pressure belt down. This is called the equatorial low. Only the spell it, right? Low. So picture a belt of low pressure all the way along the equator. So up in the polar areas, right, where the air is subsiding, right, and it is diverging, that's an area of high pressure. So near both poles, there's high pressure, and this is called the polar high. So on the exercise that you're doing, I would like you to write in the latitudes, right, and name the pressure belts. We'll get to the winds here in just a second. So, polar high. Okay, now we're going to start make the air start to rotate so it gets a little bit more, more complicated. So, what happens at about 30 degrees is the air begins to the air begins to subside. It piles up and begins to subside. So, the air would do this if the air is subsiding and diverging, if you look back over here, that's high pressure. So right there, near about 30 degrees, 
we're going to put a belt of high pressure in. And this is the belt of high pressure that dominates California in the, um, in the summertime. It makes it really hot in the Central Valley and makes it just wonderful over here at the beach. So this is going to be at about 25 to 35 degrees north and 25 to 35 degrees to the south. And this belt of high pressure, which will extend all the way across here, is called the subtropical high. Again, this dominates us here in this area, both San Luis and Visalia, in the summertime. So on your exercise, be sure to write these in. Subtropical high. I have one more pressure belt to show you. Okay, so you have to watch closely on this. All right, because the hand is quicker than the eye. And Big Dave has a lot of quickness, like watch. Did you see that? Now, many of you probably didn't see that, so I'll slow it down for you, okay? All right? All right, I'll slow it down even more. All right, anyways, watch this. Here we go, okay? So, I got cold air coming from the, uh, coming from the poles, meeting warm air from the subtropics. The warm air is lighter, so it's going to rise. And in the southern hemisphere, the same thing. I got cold air. So if you go back to this diagram, when the air is rising, that's low pressure. Okay. So let's let's draw let's draw these in right here. So this would be at about 60 to 65 degrees to the uh, to the north, um, and about 60 to 65 degrees to the south also. And this is a belt of low pressure. And this is called the subpolar belt. Okay, the subpolar belt. Okay, and those are the pressure belts that exist on our planet. Now, on your diagram, it shows three cells in each hemisphere. This is the Hadley, the barrel, and the polar cell. So we create something called tricellular circulation. Next, let's put the winds in. Okay, winds blow from high to low, okay, and they're deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere by the Coriolis effect, and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So winds go high to low, to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. So I'm gonna draw these in. I'd like you to draw these in on your diagram too and give me the right latitudes. So here we go. So these winds right here are going from subtropical high to subpolar low. That's a side view. Here's the top view. High to low, deflected to the right in the northern hemisphere. Okay, high to low, to the right in the northern hemisphere, high to low, and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So draw your arrows like this, high to low, to the left in the southern hemisphere. So, these winds right here go from about 5 to 25 degrees um, in the northern hemisphere and 5 to 25 degrees in the southern hemisphere. So let's draw these guys in here. All right. So 5 to 25 in the northern and southern hemisphere. Now these are, these are prevailing winds. I'm going to put a P here. These are the winds you would be in when you go to Hawaii. And these winds are called the trade winds. These are called the trades. Okay. And the trade winds go, they're from the east most of the time, so I'm going to put easterlies in here. Okay. And in this hemisphere too, there are the trades. And these are easterlies. Okay. And again, those are the prevailing winds you would experience if you were to go right to Hawaii, or I went to Fiji, I experienced those there also. Okay, so next we have a group of winds that go from about 35 to 60, both north and south, 35 to 60. So let me draw those guys in. Okay, so these winds are going from high to low again, subtropical high right here, to subpolar low. Subtropical high to subpolar low. So here we go, high to low, 
deflection to the right in the northern hemisphere, high to low, deflection to the left in the southern hemisphere. So draw your arrows like this. And again, these winds are going from about 35 to 60 north and about 35 to 60 south. Okay. So these winds, these winds, this is a wind belt that we live in here in California. This is the westerly wind belt. Most of the time in California, the winds come off of the, come off of the ocean, correct? So I'm gonna put a P down here. That means prevailing. That means they come from the same direction most of the time, and these are called the westerlies. Again, this is the wind belt that we live in here for the most part, all right? In California, the westerlies. Okay, I got one other place where I can go high to low. So I can go high to low from the polar high to the subpolar low. These winds right there. So I'm going to draw them in like this. These winds are going to the right in the northern hemisphere. If I were driving a car, I'd be banking off to my, to my right. Southern hemisphere, high to low, off to the, off to the left. Okay. So these winds go from about 65 to 80 degrees north. Okay about 65 to 80 degrees to the south. Okay, I think I can take this off of here. I don't need to confuse it anymore. So these are prevailing winds also. And these are called the polar easterlies. The polar easterlies. the prevailing winds that exist on our, on our planet. Now there's a couple areas where there are variable winds. The variable winds come from different directions, like right here at the equator. The winds are kind of coming together right there, and the air is rising. Sailors will get caught down here sometimes in the past, be hot and muggy. They say, man, I feel like I'm down in the, down in the doldrums. Maybe you heard that expression before. These are variable winds. So there's one more other area where I want to see again some variable winds. And maybe the best way to do this would be maybe to circle that just like that. Put an arrow out here. Now, back in the 1500s, when the Spanish were coming over to the New World, people like uh, Cortez and Pizarro, they would bring horses with them. They were conquistadors, right? And sometimes those sailing vessels would get stuck right about here, where the arrows are moving away from each other here. Right, where there are no prevailing winds, and the horses would drink a lot of water. If they got stuck out there too long, they would throw the horses overboard. Sad story, I know. But this part of the world, where there are variable winds, becomes known as the horse latitudes. So write that in there. Southern Hemisphere 2, horse latitudes. Horse latitudes. Okay, so those are the winds. Prevailing winds and variable winds exist on our planet. The pressure belts are over here on this side. I think I did ask you to put in the polar jet and the subtropical jet stream. Where you would want to throw these guys in would be right here. This is where the polar jet would be located. So jet streams are winds that blow at an even higher velocity. They're up in the atmosphere, 30, 40,000 feet, they can blow 100, 200 miles an hour or more. And I asked you for the subtropical jet, put it right about there between the Hadley and the Farrell cell. So if you could sneak that in there, this is where the subtropical jet would be. Now I can't remember on the exercise if I asked you to put in the intertropical convergence zone. Intertropical convergence zone. If I did, it just put I T C Z in the equator. If I didn't, don't worry about it. So, oh guys, I forgot one thing. I know it's a mess already. I forgot one thing. I'm so sorry. All artists must sign their work. Tell me, is that not a masterpiece right there? Jackson, I think I'm about done. I think I've tortured these guys enough. So this is Big Dave signing off from Cuesta College, and I'll be back to talk to you guys again soon.